Hello, Rob. How are you? I am very well indeed. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I'm very good indeed. Have so, you got exactly the same earphone that I've got? Have you got a Beats Fit Pro in, have you? I do. Ah, oh, it makes it so much better because I'm not getting any <laughs> reverb back off the laptop. I can hear you much more clearly. We no, may even have a slightly more interesting and articulate podcast this week. We'll, see <laughs> well that one makes can that only much, hope, can't they? Well, I think that makes that much difference. <laughs> what are we talking about today? Okay. Well, I've had a couple of people write in to ask about or to talk about traumatic events in the past which they believed had triggered their emetophobia. It was something that has been yeah. caused by something that happened to them in the past um, and they wanted us to talk in, in a little bit more detail about why it's not about a traumatic incident in the past. And I thought it was a really good one because when I was thinking about it and my own journey through it, I was thinking, well, I could, in my mind at the time, pinpoint where at the time I thought it started and, and a particular incident, and I kind of blamed it on that, which makes sense that people do that because you'll go, well, what, why have I got all these thoughts? Why am I doing all this? Why, why is life so hard? You're, in, you're used to looking for answers and trying to find an answer, and that seems like a logical place to look in the past. So I thought we could just have a chat about today, well, why it's not about something traumatic that's happened in your past. Fab. Yeah, so I think I think there are n- most of the other therapeutic narratives as to why anyone has any sort of phobia almost always tries to find an initial what they call initial sensitizing incident or a or a trigger or or an incident that was so emotional or so stressful that that that's what's caused the phobia if you like yeah yeah and 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 for almost all phobias it's just not true um but specifically so for metaphobia it's not true and is an unhelpful understanding for people to have for lots of reasons so first of all why why believe something like that well as you quite rightly said people think about you know why do i have this phobia where does it come from but what we certainly know about emetophobes is they're very bright they can be very driven quite obsessive and uh, with a really strong desire for control so they spend an awful lot of their time they spend perhaps sometimes hours every day trying to understand their phobia trying to see where their phobia came from right trying to make sense of it well i didn't have it when i was 10 uh, and i did have it when i was 12 what happened there what what could have caused it and of course we look externally for a reason why it would suddenly start bearing in mind of course it wasn't an external thing it was an internal thing it was their beliefs and their thinking styles etc but if you think that if you think about all the main phobias all the common phobias heights darkness cancer dying needles spiders snakes getting caught in a lift airplanes all of those situations are symbolically identical right they're all situations mm-hmm. where someone might fear being out of control yep. so all phobias are about being out of control it's, just, it's yep. the same thing okay and when you feel out of control your desire for control invariably gets much stronger so you then go looking for you trying to understand if you speak to anybody anyone listening to this podcast watching this podcast Go and speak to anybody you know that's got a phobia, and I bet you nine times out of ten, they'll tell you in their story, oh, I know when it started, it's because of this. Yeah. Everyone, for example, that thinks that everyone that's got a phobia of dogs believes it's because they're bitten by dog ones. Okay? And as most people have at some point been bitten or at least nibbled by a dog, it's a logical um, assertion to make but can send you completely off on a tangent. You might spend your entire life believing it's all because of that, which is really, really unhelpful. Also, you know, I I haven't got the research in front of me, but it's in the manual. I can't remember what it was, but I think it was something like 22% of emetophobes don't ever remember being sick. Mm -hmm. And something like 17% have never even been sick. Yes. Okay, like so that, yeah. how how could how could that possibly be the cause of their phobia, right? Yeah. So I know that both those figures are around about twenty percent each. The other thing you ought to think about is there are twelve million people in the UK with a fear of flying. None of them have been in a plane crash. Yeah. Okay. None of those twelve million people have ever been in a flight that was so threatening and frightening mm-hmm. 
-hmm. it was suitable, it, it was sensible to develop a phobia. Okay? And to back that up, and you may or may not know this, after 9-11, this is putting you on the spot now, after 9-11, Michelle, yes. what, what increase in percentage of people worldwide had a phobia of flying after 9-11? If I think about that, well, one, that's trivia. I don't know. <laughs> is yeah. the answer? I really don't know, but I would guess more <clears throat> and a definite increase. You you would think so, right? You you, you yeah. one one would assume that after nine eleven, seeing those two planes crashing into the twin towers, that a significant higher proportion of people would develop that phobia. No, yeah. the research okay. says that no new people developed a phobia, but those that already had the phobia now had something to pin it on. Okay, well, of yeah. course, I've got a fear of flying. Look what happens. Yes. Yeah, so they've got yeah. something to pin it yeah. upon. So uh, with the metaphobes then, why why does everybody, uh, everyone with a phobia will tell you that they think they know when it started? They say, oh, yeah, it's because i got a fear of spiders because my sister put a spider down my back when I was 10, or i got a fear of dogs because that dog bit me when I was five, or i got a fear of driving or a fear of this. And almost always those aren't going to be the, the actual cause of the phobia because the cause of the phobia are a person's thinking styles and beliefs. They're an internal thing, not an external thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. So emetophobes were bright and a little bit obsessive and had a strong desire for control and some disgust propensity and some perfectionism and some black and white thinking and, and some catastrophizing and probably slightly lower self-esteem before they ever developed emetophobia. Mm -hmm. Okay, they don't have a metaphobia and then develop those thinking styles and beliefs. They develop a metaphobia, they create a metaphobia because they've got those thinking styles and beliefs, not yes. the other way around. Okay, but if someone is, is really hooked into the belief that they have a metaphobia because they were sick as a child once when they were five and mum's always told them, oh, yeah, it started straight after that. And it could quite easily have started straight after that, but that's still not the cause. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that person then goes through life believing that a traumatic experience has caused their phobia. They're probably going to believe that they will always have their phobia unless they resolve that traumatic experience. Yes. Therefore, how could something like the Thrive Program or a Metaphobia Free help them get over their phobia? What I really need to do is go for long term psychotherapy to find this traumatic experience and resolve it. And of course, what happens sometimes is people do go for long term psychotherapy and they do attempt to talk through those early experiences where they, where they were ill and they find that their phobia does get a little bit better. Well, of course mm -hmm. it does, because you change the belief ever so slightly. Yeah. One of the ladies that wrote in to us this week, though, had her emetophobia manual sitting on her desk for three years before mm -hmm. she picked it up and went through it. And I think you're going to end up doing a podcast with her soon. Her name's Bree Billington. She's just yes. about, she's just trained to be a, a Thrive Programme coach down in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, she overcame her metaphobia in two weeks. I let her tell the story, right, because it's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But she had the manual for three years before she picked up. It was sitting there on her desk every single day. She's a scientist, by the way. And the reason she didn't pick it up, or one of the main reasons she didn't pick it up, was because... In her mind, she absolutely believed that her phobia was caused by a traumatic, traumatic incident. Therefore, how could studying a manual possibly get her over that? So that belief was really unhelpful, yeah. um, for her at least, and for several others. And I would suggest that probably there is a large percentage of metaphobes out there who either have that belief or have been persuaded to, to believe that, mm. and that that is preventing them from cracking on with the uh, cracking on with the program or throwing themselves into the program because the other thing is of course is if you believe that your your metaphobia is caused by a traumatic experience or an incredibly stressful experience and you do go through thrive or you do go through metaphobia free maybe they also think that they're going to somehow have to go back through that experience and remember that, being yeah. sick yes traumatically yep. and they're yep. certainly not going to want to do that Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Obviously, I would say at this point, that never happens. That's not part of the program in any way, shape nope. or form. Okay. Nope. 
So, but the notion then of it being something from their past, it's part, it's part of something that I've just added to the emetophobia manuals this week. So we've just done a new updated emetophobia manual, went out this week. Those people that have got access to the online program, they'll see it in there in the next week or two. Um, and we've added in a section called It's Not About the Past, which has been in the main Thrive Programme manuals for a couple of years now, but just hadn't been in the Metaphobia manual. I didn't want people to get hooked up on it. But essentially what that's saying is, in relation to your sense of power and control over your life and how powerful you feel generally, a large number of people, I wouldn't say blame their past, but give us a reason for their current issues or problems, in this case, a phobia of being sick, on their past. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Either that's because they've had it a long while, and of course that means you know it's it's been in my past, or there was a traumatic, or they believe there's been a traumatic reason for it, or a stressful reason for it. But there are, there are essentially two parts then to the fact it's not about the past. And I know we're going to do a, a more detail on it, but let's give them a brief overview now. Yeah. Two main parts of that one one is the way that memory works. People people believe that we bottle up memories. People believe that we have a a store somehow in the back of our mind of all the photos we've ever seen and all the videos of of all of our experiences. And that you know, if I've got a phobia of dogs, and you show me a photo of a dog now, that pings in this traumatic video this memory of me being attacked by a dog when I was seven spontaneously comes into my mind and plays and I'm traumatized by it and that's the nature of it well it's 100% absolutely not true we don't store memories like that in fact we don't store photos or videos at all in any way shape or form they don't exist okay memories are constructive process so if I were to now picture in my mind being attacked by that dog when I was five I've just constructed that all right, I've just created it. I've just built it brand new, out the box, just built it for you there and then, okay? It wasn't that it was in the back of my mind. It's not like a photo that's sitting here on my desktop right now that I pick up and look at. That's been there the whole time. This hasn't. This didn't exist yep. until I just created it a few minutes ago. So the notion of this traumatic memory somehow being there affecting me is just not true. And mm -hmm. as I say, we're going to go into more detail about this next week. The other part of it's not about the past is that well, what about the memory? What about the emotions then? You know, have I am I terrified of dogs because I've got this memory bottled up and all this emotion bottled up? Mm -hmm. And every time I see a dog or even a dog barking, my heart starts beating fast and all this emotion kind of rushes to the surface. No, that's not true either. We don't bottle up emotions at all. Mm -hmm. You have no stored emotions whatsoever. Now, this goes completely against what pop psychology tells people right and against everything you'll read in hello magazine and everything like that okay but we do not store emotions anywhere right so if you feel angry now okay you're creating that anger right now in this moment okay if you're feeling sad now or depressed now you are creating that in this moment it's not sadness that's coming up even if you're feeling sad because your favorite uncle died 10 years ago OK, it's still not sadness coming up now. OK, you are thinking about your uncle. You are missing your uncle. You're generating sadness. You're feeling mm -hmm. sadness. OK, yes. it's not stored emotion that's somehow bubbling to the surface. So even if someone did believe that they had some kind of traumatic or very, very stressful experience uh, in the back of their mind, or, the, or, or that their emetophobia was somehow triggered off by some stressful experience, okay? The memory doesn't exist, and the emotions don't exist. Mm -hmm. So even if it were true, even if your emetophobia back in the day was caused by you choking on a marble at school one day, that's still not the reason why you had emetophobia. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? Because the memory doesn't exist. I'll explain more about it next week. And the emotion certainly doesn't exist. All of those things are constructive and are being created in the moment now. Okay. Yeah. And that's also, if you think about it, the um, reason why if, if, if people, 
it's also comforting in, in a funny way to be able to blame the past mm. yeah because yeah. although although it's it's weakening you by doing so it, it's fulfilling the need to feel more in control because i don't know where it started right i can see okay it started yeah. there because of that that's what's going on there and even though that yes. belief is really unhelpful for you overcoming emetophobia you feel more in control because you think you understand it more and yes. it's a bit like an emetophobe safety seeking behaviors they yes. they feel more in control washing their hands three times one would have been enough mm -hmm. right once enough but they feel more in control doing that a little bit yeah. ocd i might feel more in control and calmer if i just go and check the doors locked a couple of times mm -hmm. It okay. yeah. doesn't actually affect my life at all, but I feel differently when I do that. I'm changing my feelings a little bit. So it also affects then this whole notion of the word trigger, which I used a minute ago. Now, you know I never use the word trigger, right? But I said it yeah. uh, on purpose. So I don't use the word trigger uh, uh, at all, actually, but certainly not in relation to metaphobia. I think it's a pejorative term, okay? And what I mean by that, I mean it carries way more meaning to it than people understand when they use it you think about it for a minute why why do people use the word trigger what they're saying is there was a loaded gun mm -hmm. that gun was there ready to shoot that person and all they needed was just to touch the trigger now that that's a massively catastrophic statement and belief right that's like saying that i've got this memory of, of this dog attack i mean i've got all that emotion there and it's all loaded ready to go you just got to say the key word you got to say that trigger word or just show me a picture of a dog and boom beyond my control it's going to set in motion all these things right so we don't use the word trigger because it suggests that the person's powerless and it suggests that their reaction is already there just like a loaded gun waiting to go off which reduces your agency and, and leads you to think that you've got less control over it than you have. So we just talk about, you know, incidents that you reacted to. It's not a trigger. It's not a trigger that you saw the date it was out, out of date on that milk you had, right? Okay, it's yeah. not a trigger. Mm -hmm. It's just something you that, that, that you reacted to or something that you overreacted yes. to. Yes. Okay, because then that puts the onus back on you. Yes. Okay, because yeah. it was something you overreacted to. Maybe it's something you can change. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if it's a trigger and the gun was already loaded and there's nothing you can do about it, well, then, of course, you're powerless. And yes. every time you see a bottle of milk that's out of date, yes. it's going to fire that gun again. Absolutely. Okay, it's so understandable use... people use trigger, isn't it? It's understandable yes. because of the speed of your reaction. So mm -hmm. remember when I was an emetophobe, you know, if you're talking about off milk and you realise you've drank half a cup of tea with some off milk in it, that reaction you have, that sick feeling, it's instant, it's straight away. It's in yes. the bottle, react straight away. So it's understandable that it you, it feels like a trigger. It feels like it's already loaded. It feels like you've got no control over it. But as you go through the program, you understand what is creating, what you are doing every day to maintain that reaction. And actually, when you start putting effort in to change that and calm down all of your thinking styles, that reaction gets less, gets less, gets less until you don't react. So you do have a lot of control over it. You just don't know that you do yet. Yes. Two quick things. I created a new video yesterday and I'll share it with you so you can share it with you, with um on our social media and it's partly mm -hmm. about that um it's about understanding why we why we create uh, um the amount of anxiety we do in relation to something we're frightened of maybe we'll do a podcast on that the other thing was um I'm going to be really pedantic now mm -hmm. I wrote these words down straight away so we often feel when everyone's got any sort of phobic reaction or any stress reaction, we always feel that it happens straight away. And they mm -hmm. say, well, you know, all I did, I saw the date and immediately I'm feeling, and I'm going to be really pedantic, right? Yeah. For, for good reason, hopefully, okay? Yeah. It's not straight away mm -hmm. and it's not immediate. It mm -hmm. feels like it is, it right? Like and it, it yeah. might be as quick as a millisecond, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But it's not straight away because it's because we still have to process what that means mm -hmm. yeah so Absolutely. a date I'm, i got my i got my mobile phone here on a stand in front of me right it's got the date on it okay mm -hmm. it's not not making me do or think anything right yeah. until i go oh crikey it's my mum's birthday and i forgot to send her a card 
yeah. then it has some meaning. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. often these things feel like they're immediate and straight away. And what could what could I do? And I, I saw it, and it was an immediate reaction. Mm -hmm. It's unhelpful to think of it as an immediate reaction because it kind of suggests we again we didn't have any control over it. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what we do is apply meaning to what we've seen, yes. and we're reacting to our meaning. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if we change that yeah. meaning, we change everything. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's. I think when you're from the perspective of an exometaphobe, when your head, because your head is full, it feels very full all of the time because you're constantly very happy, vigilant. You're very obsessive. So I think because you haven't got that insight before yeah. you go through the program, it feels immediate. So I think it's it's the understanding that once you learn, which is the beauty of the program learning about yourself, learning what you are doing, how you're responding, why you're responding, no, never mind how quick that response is, you are still doing something, is so empowering. It's really yeah. empowering. And it's actually linking back to, you know, the the memory thing. Some people, especially with that PTSD, people say, well, I've got PTSD because of when I was sick, it was so traumatic, you know, and the memories just come back out of nowhere. That education, that understanding of what you're yeah. doing, why you are bringing that to the forefront as often as you are, massively empowering. Yes. But again, as you said, goes against the narrative of most other therapeutic interventions out there. So hard for people to wrap their head around initially. Yeah. And, the, and, the, and, and the reason, and the reason why, the reason why people use those narratives and like the the trigger narrative, right, is because it, it makes perfect sense. It's a, it's a really good phrase to use for everything else, right? Um, and and if it wasn't disempowering to people, we would use it because it's a, it's yeah. a, it's a great phrase. It's very visual. It's a great visual metaphor, and it kind of makes perfect sense. It's only that it's disempowering yes. to the people. It's like saying good luck to, to your daughter is going for an interview today. She, yes. You know what she you know she knows what you mean. You mean you mean you know do well, enjoy yourself, have have a good exam, do your best. Okay. But actually, you said good luck, and what you're yes. doing is making her think that her success today is is comes down to the flip of a coin, and not yeah. the fact that she's worked her ass off the last six months. Yes. So th these little things matter a lot. Yes, completely agree. Um, I feel like that's a whole podcast in itself. The uh, external oh, <laughs> external beliefs so. you just <laughs> yeah, yeah, you just threw so, out there with the lock business. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry, but no, about that's that. fine. No, that's all right. Well, we will do another podcast on that. I think that think we will do. A good yeah, yeah. To do. Does that answer your question though, about um, the whole notion of memory? The whole notion of uh, there's something back there causing it, traumatic, I stressful memory. I think so. I think so. I think the podcast next week will be great because it'll go more into detail, stating that it's it, it's not a uh, video that we store in our mind is really powerful but I think what really helps is people understand exactly what we do how it's a constructive process because again emetophobes tend to be very driven tend to be very bright they want to know the ins and outs they want to know what's yeah. happening there so that will be really helpful as well so stay tuned for that um but I suppose in terms of the traumatic incident when you are younger or if you're pinning it on something traumatic I think a key thing to realizes that you can't change that traumatic incident it's always going to be there it's in the past but you can change the beliefs you've created about it and you can change how you view that and that yeah. doesn't take years of hypnotherapy which i think potentially you could talk a little bit more about being your background as a hypnotherapist yeah why yeah. we don't need to go into looking at it reliving it or rehashing it why is that not necessary yeah we're, i'm going to cover that next week actually yeah okay definitely right Okay, we'll leave that Fair. there then, shall we? Yeah, brilliant. Oh, I did think <laughs> one other thing, actually. I thought uh, one, one uh, statistic that came to mind a minute ago, which I'm probably going to get wrong, but it's in the manual, is that if if emetophobia were about traumatic incidents, or even if traumatic incidents increased the prevalence of emetophobia, or mm. even if traumatic incidents increased the level of of phobia and people already had a metaphobia, the two following things wouldn't be true. If you're about to go through chemotherapy because you have cancer, you are less likely to develop a metaphobia, not more mm -hmm. likely. And if you've already got a metaphobia, it's it's 
likely to be less severe at the end, not worse. Yes. Also, um, if you um, if you are pregnant and have morning sickness, it mm. doesn't make your phobia worse. Okay, it, it eases your phobia. Now you had that. Did you have that? I certainly did. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Okay, yeah. so you were an emetophobe, you had morning sickness. Mm -hmm. What was your reaction to morning sickness when you were an emetophobe? Well, I I had actually overcome my emetophobia before right. I got morning okay. sickness, so that's slightly different. Okay. Um, but I suppose I, I, I was able to manage it, wasn't I? I was yeah. able well, to did get it bring, through it. Did it bring it back? Did the, did the no. trauma of being sick with morning sickness kind of no. bring your phobia back? No. no, not at all. It's complete. It's completely unrelated to yes. trauma and stress and in fact like everything in life the more you expose yourself to the things you don't like the more you get over them not yes. the more frightening they become you know yes. if emetophobes hadn't avoided being sick all their life and instead you know were as sick as often as everyone else is yes they wouldn't have emetophobia they'd be over it yes yes it does tend to be the case because you you get lots of emetophobes obviously i work with lots of emetophobes and when they are sick they will say it wasn't that bad. It yeah. wasn't nice, didn't like it, but it, it wasn't that bad. But then if they get worse afterwards, it's only because of how they've processed that. Yes. It's because of how, how they've reacted to it, not the thing itself. It's never the thing itself, as we know. Yeah, perfect. Right, right lovely. I'm, I look forward to seeing you next week then. Absolutely lovely. Right, enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Right. Cheerio. Take care. Bye-bye.